Dr. Thompson from Colorado State University. Mr. Thompson is a professor in the College of Agriculture Sciences and director of the Cancer Prevention Laboratory at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. From 1988 to 2002, he was the head of the Center for Nutrition and the Prevention of Disease at AMC Cancer Research Center. Before joining AMC, Thompson was on the faculty of the University of New Hampshire where he's a professor in nutritional sciences and director of the Human Nutrition Center. He served as a senior research nutritionist at IINT Research Institute in Chicago, Illinois from 77 to 79. Dr. Thompson has earned a PhD from Rutgers University in nutritional sciences with an emphasis in biochemistry. Following his doctoral work, Dr. Thompson received a postdoctoral training in the Department of Molecular Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Getting on Dr. Thompson's schedule isn't easy and we're thrilled to have him, so welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Pro probably don't need the microphone, do I? <laughs> but I'll use it anyway. And I will try not to be too excited. Um, I'm going to set our, I take my egg timer wherever I go, so I'm going to set it so that our organizers don't have to worry about me speaking for too many seconds. So if this goes off, we'll know I talk too long. Well, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and um, I want to start at the destination, as the slide says because I presented about nine months ago in Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Bean Board, and a couple of the folks uh, from the community came up to me afterwards, and they said, Henry, you need to say what you said last first. That was the most important. So I, I, I've re-sculpted what I gave in that presentation, and I'm gonna tell you the bottom line first and then fill in the pieces as we go. So, whoop. water's wet. Yeah. Fire is hot. And eating pulses is good for you. Hmm. So these are examples of irrefutable truths that we learned from an early age that we learn from an early age. Sure, you'll be hard pressed to find dry water or cold flame, but eating pulses, is that an irrefutable truth in the minds of all of us? I would submit to you that in the minds of many, if not most, that is, in fact, not the case, and that is absolutely the problem and why I agreed to come and speak with you today. How do we promote bean consumption? It starts not with everybody else. It starts with you. We had great dinners, a great lunch. I have had wonderful conversations, and to this point, folks were willing to share, you know? In our family, despite the fact that I'm a pulse grower or a dry bean grower, we don't eat many beans. Why is that? Start to think about it. Okay, I got your attention. I'm looking here. The thing that I said in Colorado that was considered so important, respect your product for what it is. Many times I act, interact with the Pulse community. And I do not get the sense that you share the excitement that I have, the genuine commitment to recognizing that Pulses. So, and we'll talk more about why I keep saying Pulses and not just dry bean. They are the premier, authentic, low fat, high fiber, high protein, gut healthy, anti-obesogenic food, which is non-GMO, gluten-free, no cholesterol, the secrets of the ancients rediscovered. Thanks. This will probably be way too much. 
Does that help or do you want me to just go like this? Okay, we'll see what, which way I go. So, think about it. When have you promoted pulses in that way? I can't think of any other food for which that is the message. In my heart, and I hope in your heart, you can look at that and say, nobody else grows that. Nobody else can sell a product like this. I want to be part of this movement to get pulse consumption, dry bean consumption, markedly increased relative to what it is today in the United States and other parts of the world. Well, folks, if there's ever a time for you to get on that horse and start to do the charge routine, it's today. On my way to this conference, people in my laboratory say, Henry, on Nine News in Denver, could you believe that you'd be reading in the national and international literature, less beef, more beans? Experts the world round say, the new diet? People, this is the time. That is exciting. That is free publicity on a global scale for pulses, for beans in particular. I, I never thought that I would be able to be, stand in front of you and be able to show something like that. So what is this thing called? In a very reputable scientific journal, The Lancet, in the past couple weeks, even more recently than that, uh, is um, work coming out and saying if we want to have a healthy planet and healthy people, we need to do the uh, planetary health diet. And that new way of thinking, which is actually a very old way of thinking, involves increased consumption of pulses. But I want everybody to realize the devil is in the detail. And we've just published a paper which almost no one's read because it's just coming out. And I summarized it right here. Before I get into the science of what we are beginning to understand, if in fact pulses and particularly beans are going to get a lot of international attention, we as a community need to become more aware, have answers to issues about things that people will call anti-nutrients, some of which are uh, specifically referred to as lectins, and how we process pulses so that we remove the lectins, so that the people who push the paleo diet, which is an anti-pulse diet, an anti-grain diet, so that we have a good way to address their concerns. The, the thing that many people make fun of beans and other pulses, the gas, we need to better understand the origins of gas so we can explain to people what's going on. There is much more science here than making you know, the song and the jokes about this. Not all people respond in the same way. We need to seriously understand what pulses for what people so that we don't have toxins, so we don't have intestinal discomfort, and that we learn the lessons from a, you know, many of you grow soybeans, and you say there's less risk with soybeans. Except the problem is with the way soy is being developed, more and more of the consuming population are avoiding soy products. Let's not repeat what we're seeing unfold relative to soybean and its products in the pulse field. So there are opportunities to really get with our game be able to address these common reasons people give as excuses for not wanting perhaps to consider pulse consumption. So I was recently in Costa Rica and I'm going to give for you folks today some talking points. But you know, this is after lunch and you're saying to yourself, oh, I don't know, this guy's pretty loud, maybe I should just take a nap, so I don't want you to do that. And if you have a napkin from the hotel, I'm getting to teach a lot of graduate courses. I want to teach you mind mapping. And I want you all, because we talked about this last night, you hear a talk, maybe you get a little excited, and then you go home and two or three days later, you can't remember most or any of what was discussed. If you take a napkin and your pen, or the back of your program or whatever, 
and in the center you put bean. I challenge you. So I'm, I'm challenging you that you draw six to eight lines off that center circle and you pick six or eight things that I mentioned to you that you want to have as your elevator speech for pulses that you can, because you remember in pictures, if you draw that simple cartoon for beans and put down six or eight things that I say that you want to be able to share with your friends and say, this is why I grow pulses, this is why I eat beans, it's an easy way to do that. It's called a mind map. We teach it. Everybody should be able to do this because it's a good memory technique that helps you to think new thoughts as well. And I won't get into the detail of that, but I challenge you, have your elevator speech based on what I am about to share with you. Usually I start my talks like this. I got a simple question for you. If there was an inexpensive type of food that you could enjoy eating, and by consuming that food, you would have 35% less body fat than the same, another person standing next to you that had the same height and the same weight, would you eat that food? Think about it. Here I am. I'm 165. I'm 165, but this 165 is a bean eater and my body fat's 10% versus 35%. Who would you want to be? Men and women generally will respond the same way. They want to be the person that has the lower body fat. For men, that's big, strong, you're a football team kind of person. For the women, you're very shapely and you can fit on all those lovely dresses and things that you like to wear. In formulating your opinion, if you were given this opportunity, do you recognize that in the next 60 minutes, $100,000 will be spent and 225 people will die from an obesity-related disease? Think about that. Yet, you might say, how could anybody say, no, I'm not interested, but unwittingly, the response in the United States to the question I just asked is no. I'm not going to, based on what people are eating, the answer is no, not interested. What's the food? Pulses. And yes, we're focused on dry bean, but I would suggest to you, if we want to triple, quadruple, or even go further in increasing pulse demand from within the United States, we actually have to co-develop beans, peas, chickpeas, and lentils is for the consuming public, particularly the millennials, it is such a message that they, they are responding to. It's affordable, accessible, easily stored, sustainable, low water, uh, and fertilizer, lower inputs. Folks, if you take that first message, the authentic premier food, and you take this message, it's a profound opportunity. What are the facts? In the United States, where the prevalence of overweight and obesity is very high, 60% of Americans eat no beans. Per capita, we consume, um, this is a couple year old data, on average 10 grams per day, where in other parts of the world who have less obesity, they consume a lot more bean. Does it matter? Ah, Henry, come on. It's really not so bad. 60% of global mortality every year is due to an obesity-associated disease. In the United States, $190.2 billion, or 21% of annual medical spending is on an obesity-related disease. And I will show you, and I will show you how we dig in, into, in the laboratory, the data that suggests that pulse consumption could have an impact in reducing the prevalence of obesity-related diseases. So, particularly in the next 15 minutes, I, I'm not going to let you off by saying don't, don't worry about the mind map. In the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about specific points that you could put on your mind map that develops your elevator speech. First of all, a little background. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. They are not four distinct 
distinct diseases. They are four interrelated diseases that have at the metabolic level, alterations in glucose metabolism, alterations in inflammation, and alterations in our cellular and our body's antioxidant status that are common when the disease is occurring. And in particular, if we look deep into the cell, we know that alterations in lipid metabolism are characteristic of all four disease. The way that the that that is manifest is different you know we, we know about the bulging belly or the cholesterol but here lipid metabolism is also altered in cancer and type 2 diabetes but henry come on that's that's the science stuff i had to go to paris a number of years ago and i decided to do a little experiment because i wanted to talk about this interrelatedness and this is, uh, these are disease prevalence or mortality maps from the Centers for Disease Control for the year of 2008 in the United States. And I want to, this is my home in Colorado. This is uh, a place uh, in the United States. The dark red is very high prevalence of overweight and obesity. Colorado is one of the lowest. As an example, so low prevalence, high prevalence of obesity. Prevalence of type 2 diabetes, low high death from heart attacks low high remember obesity low high death from heart attacks low high death from cancer different group in cdc made this map so they use different colors unfortunately but when you read the legend this is lower higher at the population level in the United States, based on either prevalence or mortality, you see the interrelatedness of these four diseases and you think about it. And that helps you understand how much money is being spent every year on healthcare related to obesity, which I'm gonna to suggest to you could be greatly reduced by the increased consumption of pulses. I work in the laboratory as well as in the clinic. I run a weight control program uh, in the clinic for breast cancer survivors. So I understand how we go about trying to get people to reduce weight, but I also work in the laboratory to try to use animal models and cell culture models to better understand what's going on so we can help consumers have behaviors that they adopt and then they don't hear a year or two after they've adopted this new a uh, lifestyle uh, set of behaviors, uh, oh, wait a minute, we were wrong. Because then what do you say as a consumer? I keep hearing all these dis different messages. I'm confused and forget it. I'm just not gonna bother. And we don't want that. So that is the reason for some folks that then say, who say, gee, I don't understand why you use those laboratory models. They help us hone in on what the truth, getting, we never know the truth, but getting closer to the truth so that we can give better guidance to folks as they're forming their lifestyles. And your lifestyle goals are gonna change throughout the generation, your, you know, your age. And so it's important to kind of stay in tune. And I think pulses need to be a really important component of that lifestyle, as suggested by the global health diet, which is, hey, remember, where's the beef? Nope. Where's the beans? Obesity. As we've already said, I'm just repeating, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are four interrelated diseases accounting for 60% of the mortality in the world. Oh, by the way, I'm from New Jersey, and when I need to, I can talk pretty quickly. And now I'll slow back down. So for obesity, um, there's this cool thing that's being done now more and more frequently. It's called a systematic review and meta-analysis. So a group up in Canada took all the clinical data available for when pulses have been fed. And compared to that motley 10 grams per day, which is typical in the United States, they found a group of people with an average intake of 132 grams per day, which is a very modest, but significantly more than in the United States consumption of pulses. And they found that people had better weight control, better ability to avoid obesity, and then the ability to lose weight on a higher pulse diet. Now, I gotta tell you, I think this is piddly compared to what we can and should be doing relative to weight control. But data published in a respected journal 
provided evidence of beans and other pulses being important in terms of weight control. So I took that evidence, I went into my laboratory. <clears throat> Let me, uh, so I work with animal models where animals either are very sensitive to the development of obesity, which is OS, or very resistant. And I made a diet with a whole bean, freeze dried and put into the rodents diet. And that diet was 75% of dietary protein as bean versus the control diet, which had no bean. And if you go all the way over to the end, at the end of the study, we measured the amount of body fat in the animals that were the same weight. So that's my example where I stood here and here and said, me, this weight, two different body fats, I'm a bean eater versus not. So in the animals that were not bean eaters, same weight, they were, if they were obesity sensitive, they had 27%, 28% less body fat and the obesity resistance. So you can say, oh, I'm not overweight, I'm okay. In the obesity resistant, there was an even bigger difference in body fat. They were 43% difference in body fat. That could be us, folks. That global health diet is recommending around 70%, 75% of dietary protein as vegetarian. I would suggest soy is not a good choice. It should be pulses. What's that look like, Henry? So if you're uh, obesity sensitive, your fat cells look like this. If you're obesity sensitive and eat beans, you can see visually, we measured it, that the fat cells are smaller. This is obesity resistant. Sure, we'd all, all like to be like that, but when the obese resistant animals ate beans, the size of the fat cells was further reduced. And we're trying to understand that in the laboratory. This is a very exciting time. Donna Winham is here from Iowa State. I just happened to pick one of her studies to show you that in the clinic, it's been shown that bean consumption has a protective effect against type two diabetes. I want to, and so a lot of people say, well, that's because beans have a low glycemic index. So uh, we talked about this data last night a little bit and at lunch again today. So I took at the level of specific varieties and did the same thing as we do in people to look at after a consumption, the same amount of carbohydrate from all these bean varieties, how blood glucose went up in an animal low, that's, that's a good thing relative to type 2 diabetes. Higher means that glucose is readily released. You can see there's over a two-fold difference from the best to the worst in terms of glycemic response in this animal model. People, we don't use data like this to help us figure out for people what are the varieties that will be most impactful. A goal of our program at Colorado State has been to provide strong evidence that crop variety matters. We know agronomically variety matters. I think it matters relative to human health too. And you think about it, that's not a surprise. We simply haven't positioned ourselves yet to take advantage of that and to create niche markets for people with known diseases. There's a real opportunity in that. Cardiovascular disease. Similarly, when I was in Costa Rica, if I go to a country, I want to say, look, you have data coming from your own research group that says if you increase the ratio of beans to white rice, it improves uh, the things that we measured to look at cardiovascular disease risk. So, uh, and that's probably part of the reason multiple sources of data from multiple countries indicate the value of pulses in this planet healthy diet. This is a unique time. 16 years ago when I started working on pulses, this was not the story that I walked into. This is the opportune time. The, there is a coalescence of interest and and agricultural and medical opinion that we want to put more pulses where the consumers can grab them and want to be eating them. I do cancer research, as you heard from the introduction. 
I, I direct a cancer prevention laboratory and I was actually drawn into the, the area of bean research uh, oh, 16 years ago. But in 2005, Walt Willett's group at Harvard, he's a very respected nutritional epidemiologist, published some really interesting data, data to my eyes from the, uh, the a nurse's health trial that bean and lentil uh, consumption reduced breast cancer risk. And I have worked for the past 50 years in a, a, a Nobel Prize winning model for breast cancer developed by a scientist in 1969 by the name of Charles Huggins. And this model of breast cancer re really mimics all the steps that occur in the human. And that, that's very important because people say, that's ah, a rat. Now this rat model is the model that gave us the drug tamoxifen. And if any of you folks know women that have had breast cancer or are at risk for breast cancer, you know that's a drug that's commonly used in prophylaxis of breast cancer and adjuvant treatment. So this model has been very useful in making clinical predictions. Well, in that model, we fed from no bean, which is the way Americans eat their beans, up to 75% as a uh, bean is dietary protein, which is 60% weight by weight in the diet. And this has been published, but I like to share this data because it really uh, illustrates a couple points. Uh, here's a food put in the diet, which dose dependently reduce uh, breast cancer incidence, the number of breast cancers per animal, the size of the tumors, and they occurred at a later point in life in the animals consuming the bean diet. That's kind of cool. And this just shows you the incidence data is right. Uh, and I'm not going to show you the, uh, the uh, different cultivars, but it turns out Jim, Jim Kelly's uh, beluga, white kidney bean, we happen to uh, find that variety and use uh, beluga. I had a friend at the National Cancer Institute and he said, you know, Henry, if you could show me that a food was as powerful as a drug, I'd pay attention to you. Tamoxifen, I mentioned a minute ago. We compared white kidney bean to tamoxifen relative to no bean or tamoxifen. You can see there was a uh, strong inhibition of cancer incidence, multiplicity, and the tumors were smaller. Now, I've had women who are been treated or being treated for breast cancer come up, and, and after they see this, they say, "Can I get rid of my tamoxifen?" I say, "No way." That's not the point of this slide. The point of this slide is this, folks. You say to yourself, "Oh, I just work in uh, growing a food. Who cares?" The world should care, because I'm showing you data that says that some foods have powerful effects on human health, and they can be as powerful as, dr uh, as drugs that are in current use. You have something very special, very valuable, something to be proud of, and you need to be part of spreading the message to the consumer about how important it is to increase consumption. Are you what you eat? I see some people just starting to drift off. Whoops, and that made me skip a slide. I love this because it's sort of like my mom's slide. Henry, you are what you eat. I just wanna show you, we do this really special thing, it's called metabolomics. You, take a, uh, you can take a very small amount of material and see thousands of chemicals present uh, when you run it through this particular machine, and we'll leave it at that. So I took all the data and I used this cool statistical approach that doesn't know anything about the blood samples or the diet samples or the tissue samples. It's called unsupervised clustering analysis. And I simply said, take this data and group it. And so when I took the diets from the cancer study that were either made of navy beans, small reds, or white kidney versus the control, the program actually took all the samples and completely discriminated them among them with 100% accuracy. Well, that's nice, not a big surprise, but I took two white pigmented beans, navy and white kidney. I took the blood from the animals, did the same thing, and the blood is chemically distinct. Kidney, navy, or control. We, MG is the breast tissue. The differences aren't as great, but there is complete separation between kidney, 
na navy, kidney, and control, and even in the tumors. Again, the differences aren't as great. Tumors were chemically, from a small molecule perspective, different if they came from the control versus the navy versus the white kidney being fed animals. Can the foods you eat have an effect that can be measured? That's why I show this data. You betcha. I can remember the first meeting I went to when I said, folks, we have a food deficiency in this country. And I really believe that. And I think that food deficiency is the consumption of pulses. This is what it currently is. This is what it could or should be or even higher. Back in the day, in the 60s and the 50s, the, re the recommendation was that cereal, the pulse grain intake should be in the ratio of two cereal grains to every pulse. Currently in the world, we're consuming eight cereal grain servings of cereal grains per day relative to one. That's a food deficiency. And what has pulse consumption been replaced by? Animal products and soy protein isolate. And I think we chose poorly when we went this route. I know about the risk. I heard about them and I get it. I'm just saying for the future, I think pulses are where the action is going to be. <clears throat> ah, I could cry. What's that all about? You know, everybody's saying, oh, the ingredients, let's get peas because we want the protein. Uh, let's try beans for the protein. Let's try all the pulses because we want protein isolate. I think we're, what I think we're doing is making the mistakes done with soybean. And I suggest we don't want to go in that direction. We want to say what we value in pulses that soybeans do not have in the same way and the same concentration is their content of fiber. There is a gap in this country. The gap has been there as long as I've been in graduate school, from graduate school on, so that's over 50 years. We can't get Americans to eat enough fiber. We're stuck in this 12 to 16 gram range, and we should be in the 28 to 40, but if you look historically, we should be in the 80 to 100 gram range. In this study, AARP study, when people consume more than 50 and around 80 grams per day, heart disease death was 50% of what it was in non-fiber consuming populations. That's huge. It's about the fiber, less about the protein. Pulses are special because they're a very concentrated source of fiber. This is something that we study in my laboratory. There are three components of pulse carbohydrate that we want to focus on, the insoluble, the soluble, and the total oligosaccharides. And the oligosaccharides in pulses are galactans. They're made of galactose units. People simply haven't studied them enough to say, oh, the, the galactans, let's get rid of them because they cause gas. That's just actually not true. I mean, yeah, they can cause gas, but that's not what the real issues are. If you're a breeder, you're going to say, wow, they want more fiber. There's a lot of variability. We might be able to do something about that. But from a consumer's point of view, if I care about staying thin, I want to look at fiber content per 100 calories, beans, lentils. And what do you hear sold around the country in terms of high fiber foods? Whole wheat bread? Come on. Brown rice? Really? Potato? People, you got it three times more over everybody relative to uh, grams per 100 calories. When I hear it marketed, when I hear you talk, when I hear the promotion, I hear protein. I don't hear this very important dietary component. It's not a nutrient, but it's a very important dietary component. And let me show you why I think it's so important. My laboratory, particularly in the last eight months, is trying to get around all the hand waiting. You know what hand waving is? I say, oh, pulses are good for gut health. What's that mean? I don't know, but I'm trying to find out. Let me show you some visual evidence about what
impulse consumption, being consumption, can do relative to things that we think are important relative to gut health. The very nice work coming out of Canada, and I'm talking with that laboratory, this is Krista Power's laboratory, but I want really cool work coming out of the United States about pulses and gut health. My laboratory, because I do cancer research, is very good in, in uh, doing histological preparations. And I thought it would just be fun. So most of what's in the literature I am not impressed with. So if you, um, this is a piece of the colon. This is the muscle. So when you had those contractions, the peristalsis is to get rid of the stool. These muscles are contracting. But these are the crypts of the colon. And they contain mu uh, epi uh, ciliated cells on the top and mucus producing cells. And people think that the taller they are, the more healthy the gut is. This is the control diet. This is the same type of crypt from a bean fed animal. And it's pretty easy to see with the naked eye that they're much taller crypts. Well, we want these to protect the gut. We want these crypts to produce m mucus. So you can stain the mucus, which stains blue. These are the crypts with the alcyon blue, um, the alcyon blue mucus stain in control animals. You can see with your eye that these crypts from the bean fed animals are just loaded with mucus. Third, the brown colored cells are cells that are proliferating. If you want a happy colon, you want these brown cells to be lo located at the base of the crypt, but not to go up towards the surface. You can see that there's a long extension of proliferating cells up into the crypts in the control animal, and being keeps them compressed to the side where this muscle is. We're quantifying this right now in a comparative studies of the four types of pulses because we don't know if all pulses are created equal relative to the ways they promote gut health. Very important for us to understand. But if I had one thing, and, and kind of this thing about this yourself. So I've shown you very powerful data that pulse consumption probably can help you stay not fat. Let's just say not fat. And then I can say, I think we're going to show really profound evidence that pulse consumption is good for gut health. When you walk around, what persuades you more? A happy gut or a thin waistline? Or are we perhaps maybe in a good way greedy and say, hey, you know, we want both of those things. Something for you to think about. I think very big effects on gut health. The challenges. I don't think it's about education. I think we have to emulate what's happened with other foods to, uh, to awaken awareness uh, and understanding of pulses. Um, from my very first slide, I said we have to work hard with authoritative information to bust the myths, particularly the flatulence myth and the anti-nutrient myths. And then we have to take all these newfangled things that are available to us and create new products. But I'm going to tell you, folks, I strongly hope, because I'm getting older, I hope to work another 15 years, but I hope you don't just focus on the protein component, but as many, like Karen's here, and I know she's focusing on, the, if you want to call it a flower, the, the whole seed process in the former can go into convenience foods. Uh, I think there's going to be an increasing market for this, and that's very good for everybody. In my laboratory, we're developing the Impulse Diet. It's a metabocentric weight control diet. It features 75% of dietary protein as pulses, which basically is three cups, three cups, not one cup, not a half a cup, but three cups of pulses per day. I won't go into all the metrics. This is Karen's uh, Indian diversity uh, panel. I know she'd be here, but I like to show this slide and always say, yep, I, I've had the pleasure of working with Karen Sihi, and uh, this is some of the cool germplasm she works with. Wow, can't you just love to want to work with beans and have them going into your diet? 
Are you ready to join the Impulse team? Better food, every person, every day. Healthy food, healthy living, affordable, delicious, and nutritious. Think about it. Another way, because this is partly about marketing. Eh, maybe, maybe this doesn't drive your wagon. Maybe, why don't you increase your pulse intake to have the physique of antiquity? <coughs> what I think pulse consumption will do is break the link between obesity and the four killer diseases that account for 60% of global uh, mortality. We need to understand what you, the producers, see as a picture of success. So I've asked a lot of questions while I've been here. Tell me the problems. What can make the, the, the future look bright? And one thing I think we come down to, whether it be weight control, the healthy gut, the physique of antiquity, uh, if consumer demand is stimulated, uh, you won't have high inventories. And in fact, more money is gonna pour into the R&D efforts that are needed to take the risk away from planting uh, dry beans instead of soybean. So I, I just had to throw this in there. This wasn't in the talk, but you say, right now you're sitting on inventory. And in Denver, and so I've been doing this in my laboratory for over a year, we're taking pulses, but treating the seed that's extra and growing microgreens or grains, both terms are correct. But after two weeks, you cut off the, the leaves, you put them in a bag, and you sell the bag of leaves for $60 a pound. If you gear it up, when you have excess inventory, and you start to control inventory to maintain your prices by putting it into an alternative market, which is also profitable, wouldn't that be a smart thing to do? Wouldn't that put you in control of the price of your product? I don't know, just a thought. One other thing, I, I, again, I listened. <clears throat> I'm teaching courses, I haven't done that for years, but I'm teaching graduate courses, and one of the things, and I teach a course which is about the, the combination of biomedical and agricultural sciences, and so I'm looking at new technologies. Copy down this particular YouTube. Because a lot of folks, when I've talked, aren't aware of all the uses of these drones in agriculture. So you have weed control on your pulse field. In California, they're using drones. The uh, drones can actually pick out the weeds in a, a field of lettuce. And if you're organic, they shoot the weed with an electrical charge that kills the weed. And if you are not organic but conventional, uh, it reduces the amount of herbicide you put on it to control the weeds by 80%. Either way, you're a winner. This is here, it's being done in California. Why not Michigan? So that you can monitor your crops from uh, the UP while you're taking some uh, time off in the summer so you're not always on the farm. Agriculture is gonna be different in the next couple of years than it's been. So if they are your obstacles, I don't think they need to be. Finally, you have the premier authentic low fat, high fiber, high protein, anti-obesogenic, gut healthy, non-GMO, gluten free, no cholesterol, secret of the ancient food. Be proud of it, do something with it, and join the global re revolution to improve our health and save the planet. Thank you very much. And I, I think there's time maybe for two or three questions. Sure. Yep. Anybody, two or, and I love questions. I learn from questions, so, and I don't bite. So please, if you have a question, ask away. So your slide said three cups daily. Is that cooked or dry? Oh, it's gotta be cooked. Three cups three, cooked. Three cups cooked, and it can't just be dry beans. So I kept using the word pulse. The reason it can't be, if we learn from the soy, if we learn from the soy experience, a lot of, there are increasing number of people that have adverse food reactions when you focus just on one crop. You gotta look in India, pulse consumption is pretty high in India. 
And what they did, they have a diverse portfolio of, in their cuisine. I'm not talking about a diet. This is a, a to die for cuisine. And it's going to have a diversity of pulse crops from your, your breakfast toast, which you, butter, who needs butter? Some of these tasty hummuses. I mean, it's, it's like, I, I'm a I'm toast and butter guy, and I switched over to toast and hummus. Oh, why would I go back to the other thing? It, just doesn't, it, just, it doesn't do anything for you anymore. And having snacks set for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. Uh, we were at the restaurant last night. Important story to tell you. And I said to the waitress with the group present, I said, so what's on, or I'm waiter. I said, what, what beans can I buy here? We don't have any. So by the end of the meal, we were talking about this dynamite um, dark bean uh, brownie. With, so the, you get the bean brownie and then uh, with a beautiful whipped cream, but it's not whipped cream, it's aquafava. So it's the juice out of uh, chickpeas. I had this in Nebraska bean day prepared by a master chef. And you guys have great coffee in Michigan or if you get it from Costa Rica, that restaurant would have a line just for their black bean brownie with aquafaba and coffee. I mean, and, and you can suddenly envision your, your food consumption pattern where pulses are an integral part of every meal and every snack. And you know what? You enjoy it more than you ever did before. I see that as the future. And I see there's only one problem and that is people are complacent and they're not willing to put in the work to see that happen. But younger people, this is the future. At least that's my belief. Thank you for that question. I will get off the soapbox, but I really believe in this stuff. Any other questions? I don't wanna run your, your thing long. One more, two more. Okay, thank you very much.